for today. Uh, today we are joined by Ron Shevlin. Ron is a fintech analyst, marketing blogger, and most recently author of his new book, Smarter Bank. Published in January this year, it's already a bestseller in the wealth management category on Amazon.com. Before we start the webinar, some logistical details. The webinar will be recorded. The slides and recording will be shared within 48 hours after the closing of the webinar. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so don't worry. Ask your questions away via GoToWebinar panel or on Twitter using the hashtag Backbase. I will make sure we monitor both throughout the webinar. A short note on the agenda. We start off with Ron, the keynote speaker of today, who will be talking about building a smarter bank. Then we go to Yelmer de Jong from Backbase, who will have a 10-minute presentation about how to regain control over your digital banking strategy. At the end, we will have a Q&A session of about 10 minutes. Again, the slides and recording will be shared within 48 hours after the webinar. Now, without further ado, I will just switch to Ron Shevlin, and he will be presenting the Building a Smarter Bank. Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, let's see here. Can, uh, just give me some verbal indication. You guys can see the, uh, the title screen there? Uh, yeah, we see your screen. Excellent. I'm going to put that into presentation mode so that everybody uh, can see that better. And I want to thank uh, Yelmer and Christina and all of Backbase for giving me an opportunity to uh, share some thoughts and ideas with you today about how to build a smarter bank and really where the industry is going and what some of the forces of change around the industry are. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with P.T. Barnum, who started, of course, Barnum and Bailey Circus. And a long time ago, P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born every minute. And by virtue of all of you registering and attending this, this webinar, you've pretty much uh, indicated that you're not one of the suckers. But I tell you what, you look around your organizations, pick up uh, Twitter, look at what's going on in the blogosphere, and I'll tell you that it's my take that there is no bigger sucker on this planet than that person who believes that the answer to this question, which was posed by the themotleyfool.com in a recent article, uh, no bigger fool um, or sucker on the planet who believes that IBM is about to make banks obsolete. The purpose of the article was to demonstrate that IBM is building technology to basically create block blockchain technology that would help move money and basically cut banks out of the equation. Totally ignores what IBM's business model is and how much money they actually make off of selling things to banks, that they would hardly want them to go out of business and become obsolete. But more importantly, it ignores the larger trend that's going on in financial services and the point that I, I really want to hammer home today, which is that the future of banking is about money management, not money movement. What's going on in the payment space with mobile payments and, and other types of approaches to the changing the way payments are done and moving money is all well and fine, but and it may reduce revenue to banks and profit margins and so forth but it hardly cuts banks out of the equation. And I want to tell you a little bit more about why I think the future of banking is really about money management. Now, if we look at the industry as a whole, there really are three forces of change. How consumers' behaviors and attitudes are changing, how technology is changing, and how the industry structure and the economics of the industry are changing. I don't have time today to go into depth in all three of these areas, what I'd like to do is give you some highlights from both the consumer and the industry structure perspective. Uh, you guys are probably pretty familiar with all the technology development, so I really want to focus on the consumers and industry structure um, uh, forces of change here. Let's start with the, the consumer view. I would imagine at this point you're probably pretty sick and tired of hearing one speaker and pundit after another tell you about how financial uh, how consumers' behaviors and attitudes are changing and and how there's a new financial services consumer out there. And I hate to jump on the pile and be just uh, just another one of those pundits telling you that, but what I do hope to do is perhaps give you a bit different angle on this. That's today's, uh, that's the new financial services consumer right there on the right. She's young, and as you can see, uh, she is in love. Well, with her smartphone, that is. Uh, but the reality is, is that we're all in love with our smartphones and the, the technologies that we use. The New York Times picked up on this recently when it ran an article called Attached to Technology and Paying a Price. 
some researchers had found that our addiction to technology is changing our brain waves and certainly changing the way that we communicate with one another. You probably can't see very clearly what that guy on the right is typing, so let me blow that up for you a little bit. Yep, that's me right there. can only tweet to communicate. But it's more than just an addiction to technology and more than a love of smartphones that differentiates the, the Gen Wires or the new financial services consumer. Because the research I've done has shown that me that Gen Wires are the most financially engaged generation. They may not be particularly good at, good at managing their finances, but they are the most engaged. Now, I've conducted a number of research studies over the past couple of years in an attempt to both uh, measure and engage and define financial engagement. What I did was I looked at 15 different activities related to the management of one's financial life, budgeting, expense categorization, tracking interest rates, evaluating the return on your savings and investments using educational materials, comparing your financial life to other people. Those 15 different activities altogether. And in a number of surveys I conducted, I asked consumers how frequently did they engage in these activities. And what I found was that Gen Wires, by far, are more likely to be engaged in the range of activities than older consumers. And even within the Gen Y population, there was a significant difference between younger Gen Wires between the ages of, say, 21 and 26, and older Gen Yers between 27 and 34 or 35, who uh, even are, are more engaged in the management of their financial life. There are a bunch of those activities that I mentioned that really distinguish the, the highly engaged financial consumer from, from other consumers. But there's one point in particular that I find really distinguishes both the Gen Yers as well as the, the overall highly financially engaged consumer. And that's their desire for advice. Now, I'm not talking about stock picking advice or asset allocation advice. I'm talking about advice that, that relates to your everyday management of your financial life. Things like, which financial products and services are best for me? How do I choose and select the right product and the right provider? How do I find the best deals that are out there? How do I save more money given the, the bills that I have to pay? It's those everyday types of things that consumers are, are looking and the financially engaged consumer are looking for and really not getting for the most part. You know, when uh, this is why uh, more than two thirds of Gen Yers who own smartphones are scanning labels when they go into the supermarket. They're they're looking up product reviews. They're comparing prices. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, Forty percent are having coupons sent to their smartphone so they can do a better job of tracking them. Uh, almost a third of, of Gen Yers with a, a smartphone are storing their loyalty and, and card information on their smartphone. Uh, more than a third are, are actually um, having receipts sent to their mobile device so that they can do a better job of, of tracking those receipts. Why are they doing all this? It's not simply because the mobile device has taken over their lives. It's because they have a strong desire to have get more control over their financial lives and to make better decisions about how they spend their money. Now, that's a, a, at a more general level. When that customer, that young consumer, is walking down the street, sees a pair of shoes that she likes and stops to take a picture of it, yeah, it's quite likely that all she's probably doing here is taking a picture of a pair of shoes to post on into Instagram or, or Twitter or Facebook. But she may be very interested in buying those pair of shoes. Now, there is no shortage of apps that are out there that can tell her that these are a pair of uh, Jimmy Choo shoes that cost $800. And pretty soon, there'll be no shortage of apps that will let, let her push another button and use that mobile device to pay for those shoes immediately and either pick them up in the store or have them sent to her or whatever. But there is a shortage of apps and a need for, for somebody to answer some of the other questions that she has at this point in time, questions like, can I afford these pair of shoes? Look, you can load up Google Pay or Android Pay and Apple Pay with a whole bunch of different credit cards and debit cards, but none of those tools are going to tell you whether or not you can actually afford that purchase. Yeah, pretty soon they'll, they'll, they might be able to access your available credit limit or look at the account balance you have from, uh, tied to those cards, but they won't be able to see the inflows and outflows to that account. They won't know if you've got some bills that are scheduled to pay that would make this an unwise purchase. 
or perhaps a paycheck that's coming in in a day or two that would enable you to make this purchase in a day or so. Those apps also can't answer the question, how should I pay for this? Sure, you can load up multiple cards in Apple Pay or Android Pay, but neither of those tools are going to recommend which card to use. They're not going to tell you which one to use to maximize rewards or maybe even to just redeem some of the loyalty points that you have available on these cards. And while merchant apps, I'm sure, are going to come and be able to look and see that you've been hanging around too long in the women's shoe department and make an offer on a pair of shoes and give you a deal, these apps from the merchants aren't going to tell you that there's another store at the other end of the mall willing to give you a discount if you come in, maybe on the same pair of shoes or something different. So nobody's pulling this all together for the, for the consumer. And what's happening is that we're unable to reach the top of that hierarchy of needs that we have from a personal financial perspective. There are three components to this financial hierarchy or personal financial hierarchy of needs. At the bottom level is simply oversight. What do I have and where is it going? The middle layer is about insight. How am I doing? And at the top of this hierarchy of needs is foresight. What should I do? The banks over the past 10 years have done actually a fairly decent job of providing oversight through account aggregation and with PFM tools uh, that allow you to do expense categorization. have really made it more simple, if it's not fairly simple, to, to know what do I have and where is it going. But there's a huge hole in the marketplace and from a bank's capabilities to answer the question, how am I doing and what should I do? And to that end, there's no shortage of new players coming into the market, upending the industry structure to help address those questions. You might have seen this picture around over the past couple months. It usually comes with the title, the unbundling of a, of a bank. And what somebody did was kind of take a snapshot of the Wells Fargo website with all the various uh, features and functions uh, and menu choices that were available on the site and show how, how many new entrants there are into the financial services industry that are providing these various capabilities, whether we're talking features or functions. And this has become popular in thinking of this as the unbundling of a bank. And I have to tell you that I, I see this very differently. First of all, I don't think this is the unbundling of a bank at all because many of these new providers are providing capabilities that banks have never provided. So it's not about unbundling. It's adding new features and capabilities to the, to the industry and to the consumer. But what I really see this as is less of an unbundling of the bank or the industry and more about the re-architecting of the industry's hierarchy of needs. Now, I've, I've used that term hierarchy of needs a, a couple of times now. And I hope that when I use that term, that it, it, uh, it conjures up the notion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because that's kind of where it comes from. You know, at the bottom, we need food and shelter. And for all of us on the phone, by virtue of having registered for this webinar, pretty much tells me that you're at the top of this having uh, realized self-actualization. You look around your office, those folks that are uh, who did not register or, or attend this webinar are probably sitting around scrounging for food and shelter. Uh, or perhaps even searching for Wi-Fi or recharging the batteries on their flip phone. But there is a hierarchy of needs within banking as well. At the bottom of the industry hierarchy of needs is security. At the personal level, we want to know that the money we stick into our bank today is going to be there tomorrow. But at the industry level, we, they need to know that the money that they are keeping is there and is uh, protected from folks who, who want to get at it. And uh, for years, uh, in a pre-internet, pre-mobile technology world, our money was pretty safe in the financial institutions that existed. At the next layer of the hierarchy of needs was movement. When we wrote a check or, or made a payment, we wanted to know that the money moved from one place to another. And when credit cards were introduced, thanks to the networks, the, the money moved where it was supposed to, when it was supposed to. Maybe not as fast as people wanted to, but it moved. At the type of, top of the hierarchy of needs at the industry level was performance and a need for knowing that the rates and fees that were either generated or charged were somewhat in line with where the market was going. What's happening in the industry as a result of the technology changes, which often is the result of new behaviors and attitudes from consumers, but also creates those new attitudes and behaviors, what's happening is not the unbundling of a bank, 
It's the re-architecting and creation of new capabilities across the hierarchy of needs. And this really hit home for me last year when I attended the Cybos conference and sat in on the InnoTribe uh, uh, startup competition. There were seven finalists. And I realized how neatly these finalists fit into the hierarchy of needs. Two of the finalists, where uh, one was Sixscape, which replaces username and password authentication with certificate-based authentication to improve security. And another was a firm called Insignia, which improves identity verification. Two other finalists were Epiphyte and TransferGo. Epiphyte converts currency to Bitcoins, moves those coins, and cashes them out at the other end in the local tender. And TransferGo actually moves money like uh, through uh, across borders without actually physically moving the money across borders. And then there were two other finalists, uh, StockSpot and Lending Robot. StockSpot is a robo-advisor that helps uh, consumers improve their return on their investments. And Lending Robot is a tool that matches investors with the right types of loans on, on Lending Club, in, in effect improving the performance of the return that they get on their investments in Lending Club. Interestingly, though, None of these six firms, while fitting neatly into the hierarchy of needs, was the actual winner of the InnoTribe uh, startup competition. The winner was the firm that created the new layer of the hierarchy of needs, the APIs layer, standard treasury, creating tools to help tie all of these things together in new ways because of the technology changes. So what's been happening here and what's emerging because of all of this is not just a new industry structure, but a new dimension in terms of how banks compete. That is competing on performance. If we look at this from a historical perspective and go back 50, 60 years, the basis of competition in retail banking was really all about location. Who had the most branches in the best locations, and if there was an, a tie between one and another firm, was who had the best service in those branches. Now, as we became a more affluent society and our credit worthiness improved and our savings improved and our affluence improved and we had more investing needs, what became a lot more important was not just the location of those branches and the quantity, but rates and fees. How much was I going to pay for those loans and how much was I going to get in return for my savings and investments? But the importance of location never went away completely. And what's happened is that over the past 40, 50 years, We've struggled to kind of compete between location and rates and fees with a lot of banks saying, well, we don't compete on rates and fees. But of course you do. You have to be somewhat competitive in the marketplace. And up until recently, at least, you had to have some physical location or you really weren't even considered as part of a mix or a legitimate organization. But what's emerging now because of the complexity in financial services and the, the importance of managing our money to emerging consumers is that there's a new dimension upon which banks are beginning to compete on, but more importantly, will have to compete on in the future, and that's performance. That is, not simply what are your rates and fees or your branch locations, but how well you actually help your consumer manage his or her finances. The problem is, we don't really have a good measure of performance. So what we need, and I think what will emerge over the next few years, is a number of firms competing to create a standard around what I would think of as the FIN score, a financial performance score. Now, FICO is a good step, but it's not really the answer. FICO is a measure of credit worthiness that the industry uses, but what's really needed is a, is a score that consumers accept. You know, for those of us who spend a lot of time in social media, we probably are familiar with the clout score, which is a totally ridiculous score based on the most ridiculous algorithms and assumptions but what's important is that it's become an accepted measure to some people. And that's what needs to happen in, in financial services, is that someone will come along and develop an industry standard for a financial performance score. It's a company on the west coast of the U.S. called FlexScore, which I think has developed a very interesting approach to this. Uh, from day one, the thing that interested me most about Brett King's movement was not the mobile technology, but it's a concept of the cred score, which me measured basically financial performance and provided a mechanism to have a much more fluid account structure instead of capability. So there are efforts afoot to create this score, but I think it really changes the game because when we have an accepted financial performance score, 
What that does is helps to create moments of opportunity to sell and to add value to consumers. You know, all of you who are in marketing and financial services are always searching for those triggers, those lifestyle changes, those changes in account balances, whether it's up or down, or other things that signal a need for a conversation or a need for a product or service. Well, when we have a financial score that's, that's accepted universally, a change in the score over or above or below a certain number is probably a trigger that indicates something happened in that consumer's life and becomes an opportunity for you to connect and add value if not make a sale to that customer. It helps you tie products and services to the bottom line, the bottom line here being not your profit, but the consumer's financial performance score because that's their bottom line. Also allows you to quantify the benefit and impact of financial activity. Why should they really fund a 401k? Why should they really pay off some of their credit and their debt? Well, the reason is because it's going to improve their financial performance score, and over time, that becomes important to consumers. And finally, what it does, I think most importantly, is that it establishes a new basis of competition in the industry. So rather than competing on the basis of branches, which you're probably not doing much of today anyway, or competing on the basis of rates and fees, which you don't want to compete on. But more importantly, instead of competing on this vacuous idea that you have superior service or superior customer experience, which nobody can really quantify or, or prove out, you compete on the basis of how, you, how well you help your, your customers and your prospects improve their financial performance. You'll say things like, you know, we can help you improve your FIN score by 50 or 100 points. Or you'll make claims like, in the past year, 50% of our customers have improved their financial score, their FIN score by 50 points or more. And that will become important to people because they are measuring their financial lives based on this and will want to do business with the organizations that can help them improve that score. Think of this kind of as the, the Fitbit for finance. But today, that's not out there. And I know that you are absolutely going to hate this analogy. You're looking at this screen and saying the banks will become the HMOs of financial services. One of the things I'm a little worried about in putting this slide up is that for those of you outside of the U.S. who are dialed into this, I have no idea what the health care or health insurance structure of your countries look like. I don't know if you have health maintenance organizations or even if they exist outside of the U.S. So I'm, I'm, I have a, this fear that some of this might be going over your head. And for those of you in the U.S. who look at this, I know you're groaning with pain, thinking, oh, geez, I hate my HMO. They're absolutely terrible. And of course they are, and part of that has a lot to do with the, the regulatory environment, has to do with the, the paying structure of how we pay for health care and health insurance. But it's the concept here that I'm, I'm harping on. The concept originally around HMOs was it be a single organization that would help integrate and control and, and help consumers improve their, their health care lives uh, by having a central point to coordinate and pay for the, the complexity in the health care environment. And that's what's happening in financial services. It's becoming complex. That slide with the unbundling of the bank, go ahead, ask consumers, how familiar are they with any of those 100 of firms that were mentioned on that slide? I doubt they know of more than just a couple of those companies. And even if they, ask, they have heard of them, ask them, how many individual companies do you really want to do business with to help you manage your financial life? You know, Josh Reich and, and Shamir over at Bank Simple, they really understood and got it right from a conceptual perspective that we want to deal, we want something simpler. We want something to, to help uh, make the management of our financial lives more simple. But I would argue that Bank Simple or Simple has just not gone nearly far enough in reducing the overall complexity that most consumers have for managing their financial lives and building out the technology that it's going to take to help integrate all this. That's why I think that the, the IBM is never going to make banks obsolete. And small providers like Move-In and so forth can talk all they want about disrupting banks. They're more of a partner to banks than they are a disruptor. So, Banks have a very strong role in the, in the industry of the future. If they change strategic direction, if they change business model, if they understand the changes, and I think the answer here is that I don't care what happens from a money movement perspective, and I know a lot's going to change for it, but that doesn't disrupt banks or take them out of the equation. Because the opportunity for banks is in money management, not money movement. 
Now, clearly, there will be some winners and losers in all of this. There's no, no doubt about that. I put my stake in the ground that the winners will be those that really understand that their new mission is how to become an integral part of their, their customers' lives, regardless of where those customers are. So I appreciate you guys. Uh, thanks, thanks to Backface for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank all of you for dialing in today and giving me a chance to share with you some thoughts and ideas about the industry and where it's going. Um, if you're not connected to me on Twitter, then you're probably not at the top of the Maslow hierarchy of needs and haven't self-actualized yet. So please do, and that'll help you get there. And in case you're not one of the lucky 50 folks to get a copy of the book uh, on Amazon, or you can read more about the book at uh, smarterbankbook.com. Uh, Yelmer, thanks. I'm going to turn this back to you. And uh, do I need to hit change presenter here to get that to you? Uh, yes. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Ron. Great presentation. Very insightful. I would like to remind everyone that we will have a short Q&A after this webinar. So if you have any questions for Ron, just use the GoToWebinar panel to ask your questions away, or just use the Backbase hashtag for Twitter. Um, also, the slides and recording will be shared with you within 48 hours. Uh, now let me switch to Yelmer. Yelmer uh, de Jong, he's a fintech consultant here at Backbase, and we'll talk about how banks and credit unions can regain control of their digital strategy. Yelmer, over to you. Great. Thanks, Christina, and uh, thank you very much, Ron. I thought it was uh, a great presentation. It really shows the current state of banking, where it's all heading to. And I think, and it's also a bit summarizing what, what Ron already shared, of course, in his presentation. A lot of things we see changing in the financial market and see changing in how we have to deliver financial products to the consumer. It's all because there's a change in customer behavior. And everybody recognizes is that shift to digital. It's the consumer that's changing because they're getting used to all those great retail experience they get from an Amazon. Instant delivery, with one click you can acquire a product and play with that product. Or that transparent service when you work with the Uber, you just open up your iPhone app, you order a taxi cab, immediately see where the taxi cab is, that it takes the smartest route towards you. And also, after you get out of the cab, get your invoice statement, see the map taxi driven, so you know that you're never going to get ripped off. That transparency, you expect more and more also from your financial services. More and more consumers are getting more and more used to a personalized digital experience. An experience where a Netflix, for example, when I stop watching House of Cards, at least it recommends me breaking bed, so I have something to do in the weekend. What all those companies have in common and do very, very well is ubiquity. Making sure that the products they deliver work anytime, any place, and on any device. And not only that, I can not only access them from any device, but also there's a seamless handover between the multiple devices. And consumers are so used to this and they're changing the behavior accordingly to becoming a self-directed consumer. And they also expect those kind of experiences from the financial services. And then we talk about a little bit about omnichannel. And I know Ron hates me for this because we always have that discussion, what is omnichannel and actually is it not just a marketing buzzword? Uh, and we can have that discussion later on because that, that will be great, of course. But what for me on the channel means, and I see this very much in my personal behavior and also in the people around me, that you're not longer just work using one device to accomplish the task. You're using multiple devices and multiple channels to interact with your financial institution. So if you fill in a need for your consumer, if you fill in that role that Ron is describing, at least we have to make sure it's a seamless experience across all devices. Because it's not just a marketer's dream that everybody is going through the omnichannel journey and we can use omnichannel as a bus more way more. And I already see that that more than 90% of the people use multiple screens to accomplish the task over time. Mostly that happens within the same day. And it's very easy to think about social. You have uh, your Facebook open on your on your smartphone. You of course your Facebook open all the time on your work computer to buying a new car or acquiring about a new financial services product. You're walking down the street, you see a beautiful house, you check in the app or maybe the website, the responsive website, if applicable of your financial institution, how much money you can borrow to buy uh, to purchase a home. Of course, you're never going to apply for a mortgage in the, uh, in the mobile channel. You will do that later on a different device. And of course, then you expect that you don't have to fill in all the details you already provided before, but you want to do that instantly. And that's a beautiful experience. That's the experience consumers are used to, but unfortunately not yet from their financial institutions. 
Because why is that so difficult? We all agree that every journey starts with the consumer. And we've been talking about customer experience and an outside-in approach. And it's very clear, everything starts here. It starts with the mind of the consumer, and consumer wants to accomplish a task, and the first thing they do nowadays, they get their smartphone, they get the regular device. And we know we have to cater towards that, we also realize that the hard work is not on the consumer side. With most financial institutions, the hard work happens here. It happens in the technology, it happens in the systems, and it happens in the processes. So we can keep talking about improving the customer experience, but as long as we don't fix what we have in our back end, and if we are not in control over how we present in the digital channel, it's very difficult to do that and keep innovating. And with Backbase, we, we, we run on with over 100 banks and we help them in their digital strategy and their digital channel. And always one of the biggest challenges we see is always the silo problem. And I remember that we've been talking about this silo problem for the past five years, always saying, of course, you have multiple online banking platforms. Maybe you have your loan platform, you have your retail platform, an SME or an SMB platform, and we have to blend that together. And of course, most of the financial institutions try to fix that over the past years, but we see now a no whole trend that you start adding silos again, but launching multiple mobile apps that are not really integrated. So now the complete picture looks like this. You have multiple online platforms, probably you have multiple uh, mobile apps as well, and then you have your offline channels like the ATMs, the customer contact center, and the branches. And if we then talk about handover, and if we talk about the seamless customer experience, if you want to do that in this scenario, you have to do that multiple times for every different channel. Now we think we can do that smarter. So that's what we created in the past 10 years. We created Backbase Engage. Backbase Engage is our omnichannel digital banking solution. And it helps really to leverage everything you have invested on in the past years in the backend, in your core banking system, in your backend systems in the CRM. Take that to the front end and then deliver them a superior experience that's highly personal and relevant, fast and frictionless, and works anytime, any place, and on any device to really cater towards the self-directed consumer that expects the jeweler-like experience also from their bank. For us, we're on a mission. We're really on a mission to help financials to create, manage, and optimize secure omni-channel customer interactions. We do that by delivering our digital banking platform called Backbase Engage. We really do there, we start from the customer journey. We really start outside in. We created a bank out of the box, we call Backbase Launchpad, that's optimized for retail, wealth, and commercial banking scenarios. And it's completely customizable. And I always have to put a disclaimer in here, because traditionally when IT vendors talk to bankers about customization, you're used to changing a logo. You're used to maybe changing the colors of the letters. When I talk customization, I mean you can go full blown. You can truly make it your own. You're not stuck in our technology or you're not stuck with your core, no, you have the complete freedom to create something beautiful in that customer experience, no matter what device. And we have a very smart, what we call CXP service, to manage that, om manage that omni-channel customer interaction, to take care of content management, cross-channel journey orchestration, to take care of omni-channel delivery. Of course, we have a CXP manager to put you directly in control. You don't want to go back to an IT vendor, or fill in the statement of work to change your most important digital channel. What you see in Ron's story, what you see in my story, that's all the customer interaction is happening more and more through digital channels. So you want to be in control of your digital channel yourself. You want to be able to go in, change your marketing campaign, change the services you're offering, do some A-B testing and personalization and targeting to get it, uh, get it happening. And that's what we deliver you with our CXP manager. But of course, we have to hook it up to your backend as well, because we want you to be able to work with your existing core Put our digital banking offering on top of that. Then leverage all the investments you're already made in your backend systems and your core systems, and then put that in a beautiful customer experience that you can control and that's ready for the next era of banking. But also in the fifth point, we realize we cannot do everything ourselves. So we have created a very smart, what we call open banking marketplace, where you can mix and match best of breed fintech vendors. So Ron already showed a few when he showed the Wells Fargo homepage with all the startup challengers. There is also some point solutions that can work for banks. If you have a closed architecture, you will never be able to leverage that. If you work with an open banking system, an open banking system like Backbase Engage, that is based on open APIs, via our open banking marketplace, you can very easily hook up best of breed apps from money movement, BFM, loyalty, e-statements, or whatever cool startup is out there to enrich your experience. 
So in very short, we deliver you five core elements, launch pad with user experience building blocks to get you a bank out of the box. You can immediately start customizing and truly make it your own. An omni-channel experience layer that really makes sure that it can cater towards all the different channels and also hook up to your existing backend systems. A CXP manager to put your business team, your content team and your product managing full control over the digital experience and our digital banking services to easily hook up to your core, making sure that you can enrich your transactions, we can alerting notifications, secure message center and have a very strong API architecture to make sure you can mix and match best of breed software to your core e-new presentation layer. And of course, extend that via our open banking marketplace with best of breed solution like the GCO, Ascenta, and Payfarers, and many other fintech startups you see out there, maybe presenting on Finnovate, also get it in part of your digital strategy. So we are Backbase. Backbase is a, is a software company, and what we do is provide digital banking solutions. We're rated by Gartner as the most visionary vendor in their metric quadrant for horizontal portal software, and more proudly we are of Oven. Oven rated us as really the market leader when it comes to next-gen digital banking platforms. I'm not saying here we are the market leader when it comes to uh, online and mobile banking. We realize there are many big players out there, but this report was really about the next generation digital banking platform. Described by Jaroslaw as an open platform based on open APIs where the financial institution is in full control of their own strategy. And that's what we're delivering to uh, over 100 clients across the globe. I think it's now uh, a perfect moment to, uh, to move to the Q&A. So uh, Christina, back to you. Uh, thank you, Yomar. We will now switch to the Q&A session. Um, I've already seen many questions coming uh, via the GoToWebinar control panel and already seen some nice tweets uh, with the hashtag Backbase. Thank you for that. Um, I've already selected a few. So the first question, Ron, is actually for you. Most of the scenarios discussed are very much applicable to retail banking, but how do you see it, the change in a commercial banking? Oh, well, let me take that um, more specific from commercial to, let's say, small business, because uh, I think it, it is very applicable as well. Uh, in a lot of the research I've done with understanding with small businesses to understand their banking needs, it has led me to conclude that there are a couple different segments of small businesses when it comes to their small, uh, when it comes to their banking needs and preferences. And the dimensions usually relate to three things. The, the need for, for, um, uh, for, for capital, the need for technology, and the need for advice. So clearly, uh, in, in the environment that we've been in in the past few years where the economy's been down and credit's been tight, uh, any bank that could offer a small business um, access to capital and loans uh, had a leg up. Now, of course, many weren't, and which is why a lot of them are were looking to alternative lenders and these lending marketplaces like Lending Club and Prosper and so forth. But in a world where the economy improves and the the capital loosens up and their their creditworthiness and borrowing um, uh, opportunities increase, then the shift from the small businesses that goes away from those lending marketplaces to financial institutions. Um, where the difference in choosing between providers is not simply who's willing to lend money and at what rate, but how well do they help me manage my, my small business and, and improve it. So having that, that industry capability, uh, that knowledge, if you go out to, let's say, West Texas, I'm sure you're going to find a bunch of banks out there who know the oil and gas industry inside and out. But if you go to large urban places where there's a much greater mix in terms from a business perspective, we often find that the, the industry specialization among banks really starts to, to winnow down a bit more. So moving forward is understanding and developing specialties and competencies in specific um, specific uh, industries is what's going to help address those, those small business needs. The third dimension was around technology. There were a number of small businesses who basically said, you know, we want better integration from an invoicing and accounting and, and um, banking management perspective, and that that was an important aspect. So, again, it becomes more or less a, a, a tiebreaker type capability, but also becomes a method or a conduit by which you deliver advice and help and guidance to those small businesses. Um, at the, the, the higher end, uh, I would kind of bail out on this question as not being as, as familiar with a, a large-scale commercial banking. 
as I am the retail side, but I think that the small business is still very much analogous to the to the retail trends in that money management and in fact you know expanding that beyond simply money management but the business management becomes a key competency uh, and capability and differentiator of banks. Thank you, Ron. I completely agree. Um, next question is for Yilmer. Uh, you talk a lot about omnichannel, but isn't it a marketing buzzword? What does it truly mean for banks and their customers? Yeah, of course it is a little bit a marketer buzzword, and I'm, I'm totally guilty of keep using it as a marketing buzzword, but I don't think there is any, any better word to, to describe what we see with consumer behavior. Customers are using more devices, they're using more channels. Uh, they do that in their daily lives, and it's just the fact that financial services have to cater towards that as well. And in, in practice, that means at least making sure customers get the same customer experience, no matter what device they're using. And uh, they do a smooth handover, or at least they have the option to do a smooth handover to between the, between the different devices. And also, you surprise them a bit. Uh, we have one great customer that does that. They do very smartly ask for a telephone number and email address on the first question of a multi-step form. And then when I abandon that form, then they have to trigger to the call center. And it's up to the call center representative to decide, hey, maybe we can call Yelmer and help him out with that form. And if they, they do that in a pretty non-intrusive way, really blending then digital with, with offline with the call center, and they actually increase their sales with 20% doing that. And for me, that then the, the success area because we can always talk about customer experience is better but what's the ROI of customer experience if you see really concrete that you're increasing your your enrollment or origination with 20% success then you, you're doing well in that uh, aspect and then yeah omnichannel is no longer an this word but uh, a true ROI story all right thank you very much um Ron over back to you uh, with a second question um what is the role of small banks in your vision of where the banking industry is going Oh shoot! I don't get to weigh in on on omnichannel and what a bunch of uh, never mind. I, I no, we that. stopped that. No omnichannel for <laughs> you, Ron. <laughs> okay, small banks. That's a, that, that's a good question and 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 a, and a challenging one. Uh, you know, I think I tried to paint a picture that for banks of the future and becoming this this hub, this HMO concerned with the financial health of consumers and performance and pulling and tying all these capabilities together requires, to me it almost paints the picture that you've got to be a pretty large institution to be able to kind of pull all that together. On the other hand, um, if you had to build core apps and, from scratch and online and mobile banking platforms from scratch, you, you might never get anything to market and that's what vendors are for. So there, I think there will be vendors that will emerge that see these opportunities, help pull these things together and offer them to small banks um, to smaller community banks and so forth. But there's still a, a challenge in that today's banks, smaller banks, community banks, credit unions, tend to be more geographically focused. And when they use the term community, they tend to be talking about a geographical community versus some other definition of community. And I think what emerges in this banking vision of the future, the industry of the future, is that smaller institutions become less tied to a particular geographical area and more tied to a particular segment of the market. You know, if you go back to the picture of, of the, the, that unbundling of the bank picture with all the, the logos, the reality is, is that any one consumer probably does not want or need the services and capabilities of every one of those hundred um, tools or technologies. But understanding the unique needs of particular segments of the market and pulling together a set of solutions that addresses that does, to me, open up the door uh, for smaller institutions to, to compete effectively. I'll give you an example of this. And, and another key concept, though, before I do that, is to go back to that thing I talked about almost at the beginning about gen wires being more financially engaged. And that was not simply, maybe we want to, you want to think my research is fluff, that's okay, I'll buy that. But look, I, I derived that from having done surveys and trying to quantify financial engagement. It just didn't make that up. And even though Gen Yers are, a higher percentage are more engaged, we're still not talking about a majority of consumers who are highly engaged in the management of their financial lives. And so 
I'm understanding that their needs are going to be different. So what I think happens is that the larger institutions create platforms and capabilities that tend to focus on getting everybody else in the market. Those consumers who don't care enough about managing their financial lives or don't spend much time, don't make informed choices, and then just kind of go with the largest guy who's still in the corner who they just saw the ad for or made it, made it easiest to, to apply. But for consumers who are more engaged in the management of their financial life, who understand what they're looking for from tools, technologies, and capabilities, we're looking for providers and doing that kind of evaluation, they'll seek out uh, financial institutions that, that craft solutions for their own needs. The example I'd give you, and, and it's not an emerging institution, it's one that's been around for an awfully long time, is USAA. You, what does USAA really do? It serves the unique needs of active military. And while you have to be affiliated with the, with the military to become a member of USAA, if you really look at how they structure the organization and capabilities, it's really targeted. I think of it as kind of a bullseye approach to segmentation. They know who's at the bullseye of their segmentation, and it's the active deployed military member. Look, most of USAA members um, are former military or affiliated with military who live in the United States who have plenty of access to bank to, to, to go to bank branches. But USAA doesn't have them. Why? Because they're, they're streamlined and focused at serving the active military. And so they've got call centers that, that will spend an hour, hour and a half on the phone with the, the spouses of deployed military members that help them walk through their, their issues and problems, creating technology through mobile devices to enable them to do practically everything because they're optimized for delivering on that particular segment of the market. And because they're so good at that, they get the, uh, the outer rings of the bullseye for folks who are more than happy to, 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 to use those types of products and services. That's what I think the smaller institutions need to understand is who's at the center of their bullseye and what the unique needs of those segments are. Thank you, Ron. Um, there are a lot of questions in the control panel. Um, I really wanted to select another one also for you. Uh, what should existing banks have to stop doing right now? I think that's a very good question. Is that for me? Yes. <laughs> uh, what do they have to stop doing? Um, investing in branch technologies. Digital signage in the branches. I know I'm going to get killed for this one. Someone's going to get really mad. Hopefully, it's not a, a, a client of, of the company I work for. Uh, but look, the, the, the branch investment is just um, not not building out the, the kind of capabilities I needed to, to win over consumers. We, we're still focusing plenty of investment in. Um, your branch related CRM message, we're trying to get tellers to, to become better sales folks and push messages out. I, I just think a lot of that investment is, is not going to produce the return on investment that they're looking for. Thank you, Ron, for being so honest. Um, Yilmer, a question for you. A lot of banks and credit unions are very much stuck with their existing and core uh, legacy system. So how can they implement what Ron and you are suggesting without having to replace everything they have at the moment? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's always a challenge we see with most of uh, for our financial services clients. Of course, you invested millions, if not billions, in your existing IT infrastructure, but you also see that you're being yeah, chased left and right by, by younger startups or cooler neo banks that you're just doing way better in the digital channel. And it's mostly because they focus mostly on, on the, the, the delivery side, on the digital experience side. And we see a lot of institutions, and also Ron mentioned the, uh, the role of the smaller banks. And I think they, they are pretty much most stuck with, with their core. They, they have a core banking system, one of the three big guys, and they take everything from that core, so also internet banking and mobile banking. And they have the same, exactly the same experience as all their competitors. Uh, and I don't think that works anymore in, in this era where you really have to be authentic and unique in the digital channel. So that's what the solution we're proposing is really stick to your core core guys. They'll, they'll pretty know know what they're doing in the core level, but really look to an outside vendor like Backbase with our engaged product to put a new layer, a digital layer on top of the core can really help you to be unique, authentic, and uh, let you stand out from, from the rest. And then, of course, innovate, in, in, yeah, be innovative on a quicker scale with open APIs, also mentioned per run, where you can just uh, 
start playing with the uh, with your potential partners instead of seeing them as a competitor. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jomer. One final question for Ron, and I will close the Q and A session. Uh, Ron, if there would be one final advice that you would give to bankers listening in today with regards to starting their change, what would that advice be? I, I go back to what I just said. It's about under, uh, focusing on the, the, the customer segment or segments that uh, are going to be most important to them. I think that specialization going forward uh, becomes you know, uh, totally uh, uh, most important thing to, to kind of understand going forward is which segments are you going to serve. Without that understanding, you're throwing a lot of money in a lot of different places um, that are, are going to be tough to reap any ROI from. All right. Um, uh, we are at the end of our Q&A session. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Yomer. Um, thank you all for your questions. If you have asked a question that is not yet answered, don't worry. We will follow up with an email and make sure that all your questions get the answers that they deserve. Uh, 